So hello, everybody. Greetings from Sedgwick. Uh, Kate McCurdy, the director of Sedgwick Reserve, and it's my pleasure to uh, kick this off today. I know we've all been out uh, pulling weeds. It's definitely this deceptively green background here is, um, well, it's a geology talk, so I won't get into what all you're seeing in this background, but <clears throat> what I see is a lot of non-native weeds that uh, need to be pulled, mowed, weed whacked, um, or eaten down. So uh, it was a pleasure to be able to take a break and run inside and uh, learn something about geology today. And just want to appreciate all of you that have given up um, time, and mostly art, in getting this presentation put together and giving an hour of his time to, to present it to us, but also all of you who are making a commitment to try and uh, stay current on uh, the natural world while we're living in a world of virtual reality. And uh, I want you guys to know that we are busy planning our upcoming year, uh, which starts on July 1st. And we're really looking forward to being able to be back in person. We don't know when that will be, but um, we will have uh, a post-pandemic programming that will, uh, we think, be quite wonderful. So. Uh, thank you for tuning in today, and um, Nikki is going to tell everybody how they can become more involved, both in the short future, for short term, and the long term. So, thank you, Nikki. All right, thanks so much, Kate. So, I'm Nikki Evans. I'm the relatively new uh, assistant director at Sedgwick Reserve. I just hit my six month mark yesterday, actually. Uh, and so, you know, in non-COVID years, we have a lot of public programs like public hikes, walking ecology lectures, our barn dance, which I've heard is fantastic. And uh, right now, unfortunately, we're not doing any of those, but we hope to be bringing back some public programs in the near future. So if, if that's something you're interested in, I recommend going to our website and signing up for a newsletter. I'll post the link to the, new, to the website on our uh, on our chat box. And uh, you can also get involved by following us on social media. So at Cedric Reserve, we're on Instagram and on Facebook. And last, want to give a plug for another Lunch and Learn lecture in two weeks from today. So we'll have Kenji Hiyashi, who's from UCLA. He's also a Matthias student grant recipient. So he's received uh, some funding to do research at Sedgwick and other sites, other NRS sites. He'll be giving a talk in two weeks too. I'll post a link to sign up for that. All right, thanks so much. And I'll pass it on to Mark Mays who will introduce Art. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. Hello everyone, just checking, can everyone hear me? Great. I'm Mark Mays. I'm an associate researcher in earth sciences and remote sensing at the Earth Research Institute and at the Lacretz Research Center at Sedgwick. It's a joy to uh, reintroduce uh, our, Dr. Art Sylvester to you all today as he's been involved in Sedgwick programs in the past. Uh, Art is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Earth Science at UCSB where he's been on faculty since 1968 or 1969, uh, long time. And over his 50 year plus career, Art has pursued geological sciences research on topics spanning tectonics, petrology, volcanology in the US and abroad. Uh, Art has mentored hundreds if not thousands of students to successful careers in earth sciences and beyond. And he remains active in research and mentoring today and he's powered by seemingly limitless energy. It's, it's truly inspiring to work with him. And I've gotten to know Art personally through our work in environmental monitoring projects using drone imaging. Uh, since 2018, we've worked together on projects ranging from 3D modeling assessments of the debris basins in uh, Montecito post 1-9 debris flows. Uh, just this last weekend, we did some high resolution mapping of the Hilton Creek Fault near Mammoth for a fault hazard study. And Art also assists with a few projects in Sedgwick, uh, including vegetation and some geologic mapping. And Art has also helped us with experimental uh, fire research uh, efforts at the Cret Center led by Frank Davis. Since the mid 2010s, Art has been involved in writing Earth Sciences book for the public. His first book, 
which I'll show here. Uh, the smart camera feature may uh, fight me on this, but Roadside Guide to Geology in Southern California was published in 2016 and is widely circulating. And today, Art's speaking with us about his second book. And there may even be a third book coming, which perhaps Art will allude to. So thanks very much to Art for being with us today and handing the baton over to you. Thank you, Mark. I'm uh, working here on trying to get this thing to get going here. And I want to play from the start. There we go. How does that look for a screen? Everybody can see that fine? I hope Looks so. Good. Good. I'm going to turn on a laser pointer here. There's that. Good. Hello, everyone. I wish uh, all of you a a fine afternoon here, uh, wherever you may be. I'm here in Goleta, kind of trapped in my house, like many of you, for the past year. And I'm anxious to get out there and see some of the world. I hope you are too. And uh, maybe today I can uh, introduce you to some places where you'll uh, learn some geology. Uh, I used to say when I was advising students and talking to people that uh, if you take a course in geology, the world will never look the same to you again. Uh, you'll see something new and different every time you go out. Well, uh, let's uh, see what happens here if I push this button. There. Let's go to Moonstone Beach to start this off. I think most every one of you at some time in your life has bent down and picked up a pretty rock. Uh, some of you probably more than others. Uh, doctors pick up rocks, uh, geology students. Uh, lawyers, uh, car mechanics, uh, many people love to pick up pretty rocks. So at Moonstone Beach up in the Cambria area. It's a pretty place to go. Uh, if you're going to go up there and look for some of the rocks that are shown down here in this uh, lower right corner, pick yourself, if you can, a nice sunny day, a low tide, and uh, uh, you might take your uh, well, you don't need to take boots. You can go out there barefooted. And uh, when you go out there and start looking for the rocks, like you see in this lower left corner, you want to go to places where the, the, there's a re-entrant in the cliffs. Uh, look around the piles of wood like this or piles of old logs. And uh, you're going to see very big patches of pretty rocks like this. Down in the lower right corner of this one is a shell, and that's about two inches long. So you can see about how big these pebbles are. There's so many of them out there, don't worry about picking up a few. They used to come out there with dump trucks and load them in with a big uh, shovel and uh, take them for landscaping and for, I guess for the bottoms of aquariums and all kinds of things. And there's plenty of these little rocks out there. You're gonna see red ones and white ones and black ones and green ones. Most of them are red ones, which are chert, sometimes called jasper. Uh, the white ones are mostly quartz. The black ones are pieces of black chert. And then you might find some uh, pale green ones and you'll think, ooh, that's jade. Well, no, um, it is a mineral called jadeite. It's a lot harder than jade. It has no particular value, but um, don't get confused and think you're gonna find some jade. What you probably will not find at Moonstone Beach are moonstones. Moonstone is the common name for a rare pearly white, semi-precious stone that belongs to the feldspar group of common rock forming minerals. It comes in many colors, including white, blue, gray, pink, green, peach, purple, brown, and yellow. But the specimens most eagerly sought for are colorless with a pearly sheen. They seem to glow in the sunshine and even more so in the moonlight. Well, the visual effect is caused by the diffraction of light within a microcrystalline structure containing uh, stacked alternating layers of various kinds of feldspar. Uh, the Romans thought that moonstones were droplets from solidified rays of the moon. Today, some people regard them as a traveler's amulet for protection, especially at night. 
a passion stimulant, a deflector of negativity, a cure for sleeplessness, oh, there's a good one, and a panacea for a host of other human ailments. But alas, you may search in vain for true Moonstone at Moonstone Beach in the Cambrian and San Simeon areas because this variety of feldspar is highly uncommon in the bedrock that these pebbles come from. Nonetheless, good hunting. I think you'll have a lot of fun. Take your kids up there and let them try. It's a fun thing to do. I talked to many people here in the Santa Barbara area anyway, and I'm surprised how few have been to Guadalupe Dunes. It is one of the largest dune areas on the whole western coast of the United States. Uh, it's, the, the water's cold, the waves are big, um, but uh, still it's, it's quite a place to go and I highly recommend it. You, you'll go there and uh, you'll see all kinds of dune forms. There aren't very many people there. Uh, even during snowy plover season, you can drive right down to the beach and park at a lot right on the beach's edge and walk the beach. You cannot go out into the, the dunes, but you can certainly walk the beach. Very wonderful thing to do. And some people think the best time to go is during a big storm when the waves are crashing and it's cold and, and kind of dreary. Also, uh, put onto your list of places to go uh, Oso Flaco. This is an aerial view of Oso Flaco. A, uh, you park at a lot and you walk down a road in the trees here, and then you can go out onto a boardwalk that goes across the lake. You might see some people fishing on it. And then it goes on out to the beach where uh, you can walk along the beach. You might see where the sand is encroaching upon the land as these dunes uh, increase in size and number all the time. So go there, but here's one more thing you might be interested in seeing. Guadalupe Dunes was the site of Cecil B. DeMille's epic movie, The Ten Commandments, back in 1923. It was a huge production, cast of thousands, huge monstrous sets, and um, uh, when he was all done, he was afraid that his competitors would grab some of his props and some of his scenes and some of his buildings and use them in their own movies. So he had a great big trench dug and he had all these uh, props and scenes and buildings uh, buried in the sand and covered over. And the whole thing was lost until about 1984 when some movie archaeologists went out there, discovered it and they found the head of one of these great big sphinxes. There were 24 of these big sphinxes, as you can see down here in the lower left, all lined up on both sides of a big processional area in front of this big building. And uh, you can see the size of these with respect to the people down there, just huge. Well, they didn't uh, excavate the buildings, they didn't excavate whole sphinxes, but they did excavate one of the heads and is now on display at a nice little museum there in Guadalupe, the uh, Guadalupe Dunes uh, Museum. It's been closed, of course, during COVID times, but uh, it's supposed to be reopening with a lot of other museums soon, we hope. So I recommend uh, Guadalupe Dunes to all of you. I'm sure many of you have been there, but uh, I hadn't been there until just recently. And uh, I might say that uh, Moonstone Beach, I had never been to until I did the research for this little project. Well, let's go to the next place. There are other sand dunes in California besides those along the coast. Uh, there's some out in the desert. One of the best of these, I think, is Kelso Dunes out in the Mojave Desert, right out uh, east of Barstow some distance. What makes these so good to visit uh, since 1973, off-road vehicles have not been permitted to drive around in the dunes uh, as they are in, uh, say, Dumont Dunes or, or the Algodonias Dunes down near the Salton Sea. So these dunes are pretty pristine. The winds come up and blow the sand around and make uh, new cornices, new dunes, and it's a very fun place to walk around and get to see animal footprints and animal trails. Uh, it's, it's a great place. One of the things you will see out there 
is that the sand is not all nice and white, but there are uh, fairly large black patches. The black sand there is magnetite, and there's enough of it that a fellow decided that he could make money by staking a claim on these dunes and, um, oh, I'll say harvesting the magnetite and selling it for profit. Well, fortunately, he didn't find enough of it to make any money at it. And so by the time uh, um, uh, he abandoned it, then the state turned around and put a fence around it and said, this is, shall be a park from henceforth and no off-road vehicles or mining activities here in these dunes. This is one of my favorite places to go hike. This is an aerial view looking kind of uh, obliquely at the Devil's Punch Bowl near Pear Blossom. What is the geologic structure here that's of such interest is this big syncline. You can see that it's this big U-shaped structure. Give you some idea of scale, of course, there's a road out there in the distance that comes in from Pear Blossom. So you drive up this road, you follow up to its end, and there's a visitor center there. Well, not now, it got burned down in one of the most recent fires, but they intend to rebuild it. But when you go here, you then you can take a trail that goes up like this and hikes up around through here. It's a trail that's about three and a half miles long, and it goes out onto one of these points out here where you can see the whole structure. Now, this is kind of a cool place because there's a great big fault that comes right down through here like this. It's an ancestral fault to the San Andreas Fault. And uh, it separates these white rocks from these pink rocks. The white rocks are smashed up, rocks that are 1.6 billion years old or older against these pink rocks, which are only about uh, well, 15 million years old. So it's a major, major fault. The San Andreas Fault itself is off over here to the right out of the picture. One of the reasons I like to go here is because when you hike out into the country there, you can see really nicely a big fault. Um, let me see if I can move. No, I can't move this out of the way. But uh, you'll get up here in this high area and you can see this fault uh, almost close enough to put your hand on it. And I like this place too, because in the summertime, it's cool. It's up about 5,000 feet. It's cooler there than the desert. There's there are creeks on both sides. Many of them have water. Many of them have pools in them that are good for skinny dipping. Uh, it's just a wonderful place. Lots of beautiful vegetation. And as I say, this is about a seven and a half mile round trip hike to go from the parking lot out here where you can see visions of these faults. If you don't want to hike so far, you can hike around in the punch bowl itself. You can get down here and get views like this one over here in the lower right corner and walk around among rocks like this in the upper left corner. It's a great place to take your kids for a nice hike. And they'll trip around the rocks like this. You can do uh, about a mile and it only takes you about uh, oh, half an hour. And if you want to mosey along, you can do it in uh, maybe an hour. It's a great place. Mountains up in the background, it's terrific. One of my favorite places to visit, and it's a little more than a, a, just a few hour drive from Santa Barbara or the Sedgwick Ranch. It's more nearly about three, three and a half hours to get there. The volcanoes out in the Mojave Desert. There are actually 32 of these volcanoes in an area called the Cinder Cone National Natural Landmark. One of the best ones is uh, off Highway uh, 66 or Route 66. It's called Amboy Crater. This is looking out across the part of the Mojave Desert. You go up here and park where I've got the red pointer. And then you walk about a mile across the lava field and around the side of the cinder cone like this. And then you can take a trail right up into the middle of the crater, or you can take a trail that goes up around and walk around the whole rim like that. And then you can drop down one of these trails down into the crater itself, where you'll find ammonites. You see this big uh, shell down there in the bottom and the uh, tephra rings from the most recent eruption that happened out there. This volcano is about 6,000 years old. Uh, some of the signs are 
a little bit confusing. One of them says it's 10,000 years old. Uh, the fact is, I don't think anybody really, really knows exactly how old it is. But uh, the next one that is fun to go to is Pisgah Crater. And its latest eruption is 18,000 years old. Um, this may seem like a long time ago, but uh, volcanologists have their eyes on these volcanoes saying that, you know, there certainly could be an, another eruption out here at any time. Pisgah Crater isn't such a nice looking volcano as Amboy because the uh, road metal companies and uh, people who make uh, cinders for the bottoms of barbecues or front yards have quarried this poor volcano almost level down. You can see around here the black dump for all the material that they have thrown away and uh, go ahead and, and quarry the cinders. The lower right here shows a, the volcano from another point of view. You can actually drive up onto the dump, drive around the side over here, park where this white car is, then you can walk up a road here right into the summit crater. It's a wonderful volcano because there are more things to see there than just the cinder cone and just the volcano itself. You can wander around in the lava field and see really good examples of Pohoihoi lava, other kinds of wonderful structures made by uh, volcanoes when they erupt, including some very big lava tubes. Some of these lava tubes in the um, Cinder Cones National Natural Landmark area are big enough that you could drive a freight train through them. They're, that, they're just that big. This particular one here is um, not well marked to get to, but the instructions are there on the web if you wanted to go to this one. And uh, I don't think hardly anybody ever goes there, but it's a fun one to go into. Big lava tubes. One place I'll bet you haven't paid much attention to in your getting around outdoors and trying to see things is perhaps the Santa Barbara Harbor. This harbor is uh, one, regarded as one of the biggest coastal engineering boondoggles, a uh, big mistake that was ever made along the California coast. It started out with Max Fleischmann of Fleischmann yeast fame. When he lived in Santa Barbara, he had a big yacht. He needed a harbor for it. He didn't want to go clear out to the Goleta Slough, which would have been the best natural harbor he could have found. And instead, he put up $250,000 to be matched by the city to build a harbor right off the shoreline here of the city so that he could practically walk out his front door and get on his yacht. He started this uh, in the city to, to about 1929. And when they began it, uh, it was open here at its uh, west end. Unfortunately, the longshore current brings sand down along the coast in this direction. And uh, when it was open like this, the sand would just flow into the harbor and fill it up. So in by 1931, they had filled the harbor, uh, they filled the breakwater here and filled a breakwater along the edge like this. And then you can see how the sand began to accumulate behind that new barrier. Their intention was that the sand would just go around the end here and head off down to Montecito. Uh, but in 1964, you can see how the sand piled up. They began to build things on it. And the sand would go around the edge here and then circle around out here at the end of the breakwater and uh, make a big pile of sand here and block the harbor. They thought, well, we can uh, extend the breakwater out here like this and maybe cause it to head off on down past Stern's Wharf and head on down to Montecito. In the meantime, that doesn't happen, but uh, look at all that they've built on here now. Most all of La Playa Stadium, uh, all this construction in here, all these uh, buildings, which you can see uh, are in all of this area now, uh, is all built on sand that has been trapped there by the breakwater. And uh, the sand still has a problem of getting around the end. So how do they solve this? Well, they get a dredge. 
and they dredge the sand out of the harbor. They shoot it through a pipe underneath Stern's Wharf and then pump it out so it continues on its way down the coast. When the harbor was built and they had so much problems with the sand, the beaches were starved all the way down past uh, practically the whole Rincon down to Ventura, particularly Montecito beaches and Carpinteria beaches. And they got pretty uptight about this. That's when they decided we better dredge this. That dredge is uh, not a cheap operation. It costs about $10 million a year to keep that harbor open. Is it worth it? Well, uh, I guess the fishermen think so and some of the other commercial enterprises and the people who own yachts are certainly happy to see the harbor stay open. Well, here's another engineering mistake or this was more, more than just a boondoggle. This is the St. Francis Dam near Santa Clarita. It was built in 1928 and uh, failed dra drastically in 1928 on the one night in March. You can see that what the dam looked like down here on the lower right. It was a pretty big dam. It trapped about uh, 30,000 acre feet of water. Uh, the, the dam was built pretty well. It had a twin that was built in, above Hollywood and it still stands today. But this one, broke tragically on the night of March 20 something or other in 1928. And about 500 people were drowned or left unaccounted for afterwards. At the time, it was the greatest engineering disaster in American history. You can go out there today and uh, walk along this abandoned road and see the remnants of the dam. You won't exactly see the fault that goes through the dam site through here like this, that separates Polona Schist of about 75 million years old from the Vasquez formation, which is about 20,000 years old, 20 million, excuse me, 20 million years old. What you might see if you climb up on the hill here is the remnants of a wing wall that I'll tell you more about in a moment. And the dam remnants, when the dam actually broke, there were parts of it were still standing high and those were dynamited because people were climbing all over them. And the, the owner of the, the uh, dam at the time was afraid somebody would fall down, hurt themselves and sue the city for lots of money just because they hurt themselves. But as I say, you can walk along this road now and see the rocks. Let's have a look at the rocks real quickly. One of them is the Vasquez Formation, which is mostly red sand and conglomerate, cemented with gypsum, which is not good. And then there's the Polona Schist, which is not the greatest for a dam abutment. And the two are, as I say, separated by a fault. The thing about the Vasquez formation that's so bad is when you wet the rock, it disaggregates. So if you were going to use that for the abutment of the dam and you get water in it, it's going to expand and disaggregate and could uh, leak and the water can make their way through those leaks and undermine the dam and the dam would fail. Well, that's not quite what happened either, but let's see what did happen. Here's what the dam looked like uh, when it was completed. 1928, this fuzzy image is not great, but uh, you were looking upstream toward the reservoir and the Polona schist over here is a very fissile. It's got a planar structure to it so that it tended to slide downhill. You can imagine this sliding down into the reservoir all of a sudden and raising the level of the reservoir and the water spilling over the top. That probably didn't happen here, but it has happened in other dams in other parts of the world. So the Polona schist goes underneath most of the dam up here to where the fault is. There's where the fault is and it separates the Polona from the Vasquez. The fault is not such a problem. There was no record of an earthquake before the dam broke. The um, fault, uh, you can trace downstream and find that it's overlain by unbroken 10 million year old rocks. So the fault was not the problem. Uh, and there are many, many dams in the world that are seated upon faults and they haven't caused much problem. The Russians, in fact, 
uh, know that the, some of the dams have faults and they put a rubber membrane in there so that if the fault should shift, the uh, rubber would take up the, sh the offset of the dam and it would not uh, leak, but it would fail and they'd have to drain it and start all over again. The St. Francis Dam did develop cracks in it. And I'm taking a the laser pointer on some of them here. And instead of repairing these properly, the uh, dam builders stuffed them full of oakum, which is not the thing you want to do because it uh, tends to expand and leak. So that was not so good. But what really wrecked this dam was probably that the uh, engineers wanted to gain an additional amount of water storage. So they increased the height of the dam by eight feet and built a wing wall out this direction, another eight feet, so that the whole reservoir held a lot more water. The problem with that is they didn't increase the load of the dam. Many dams uh, work because uh, the weight of the dam uh, holds the dam in place. So when you increase the height of the dam by eight feet and raise the water, you're going to raise the um, pore pressure and the rocks underneath, and that cause an uplift pressure in the dam, underneath the dam, and cause the dam to float away. That's probably what happened, was that the forces of the water bearing down uplifted the dam, and it might have just uh, partly just tipped over, at least it leaked, and then it, the whole thing failed. There's been quite a bit of research done on this dam and uh, dams are just not built some this way much anymore. They are concrete gravity arch dams built, but they sure take in consideration the weight of that dam upon the rocks underneath. Well, let's go somewhere else here. Hey, here's Morro Rock. You know, you've, you've been up to Morro Bay, I'm sure. Uh, Morro Rock is the stump of an old volcano. And so are its seven sisters. In fact, they're called the seven sisters, but there are really 13 of them out here, all the way from Morro Rock clear to San Luis Obispo. A very wonderful uh, volcanic rock, about 25 million years old. It might have looked much like what uh, some of the Hawaiian eruptions look like today, where there's a long curtain of fire, belching ash and, and lava all over the place. Then in the succeeding 25 million years, uh, all that uh, rock that used to be around here has been eroded away, just leaving the stumps of these old volcanoes. Let's look at a couple of them. Uh, Hollister Peak is the tallest one. And uh, uh, it's the same rock as exposed at Morro Bay. It's a volcanic rock called a dacite. And uh, when you go and look at it out in the parking lot at uh, Morro Rock, you'll see these little white specks in there which are little crystals of feldspar and here and there are pieces of or chunks of older rocks that have been caught up in the volcanic rock as it's been uplifted and uh, uh, it gives you some idea of what's underneath these volcanoes. There's Chumash Peak and Cerro Romulado and one of the things that surprised me was I've been driving past Madonna Inn for years and saw this hill up there I never really realized it was part of this chain of volcanoes, but it certainly is Cerro San Luis Obispo. So the next time you go up this direction, maybe take a detour off uh, there and uh, head out to Morro Bay and have a look at these volcanoes. Uh, you, I don't see how you can climb up Hollister Peak and you're not supposed to climb on Morro uh, Rock, but uh, it certainly is a fun place to go and look and, and enjoy the sea and then think about how this was a very active volcanic province about 25 million years ago. Well, your guidebooks for these uh, excursions are, um, as Mark was saying, the Roadside Geology of Southern California. And this book says, when you're going down the highway at 65 miles an hour, here are some of the things you can see. For example, if you're going to drive to Las Vegas, uh, your trip out of the confines of your COVID home and want to get out and go to 
have some fun in Las Vegas. This will take you up the highway and tell you what you're seeing. You'll look off this way and you'll say, I wonder what that mountain is over there. I wonder why it's red. I wonder what they're mining over there. And uh, gee, what are those great big bright lights over there just before we're coming into Las Vegas? Well, this book has that kind of information for not just Highway 15, but uh, all the major highways in Southern California. And uh, I think you'd find that one of interest. And then uh, Geology Underfoot in Southern California says, get out of your car and get out and put the geology under feet and go and walk around on it, such as walking around on some of those lava flows out at Pisgah Crater or going and picking up pebbles at Moonstone Beach. Heck of a lot of fun. And uh, this is a map over here in the upper left of all the other places that this book contains that you can visit. Starting way down here at uh, Torrey Pines, uh, there's a, the beach along there. It's just a fantastic geological story of uh, deposition of sedimentary rocks, and the oceans and the estuaries, sand dunes. Uh, all the way up here, with number eight is uh, the Moonstone Beach. You head out over here in the, this area, uh, there's Devil's Punch Bowl. There's tours along the San Andreas Fault. There's a, a tour of, of uh, Cajon Pass, telling you how Cajon Pass came to be. Uh, one of the most incredible things is a great landslide out in Lucerne Valley. It happened about 17,000 years ago. That landslide fell off a mountain, plunged about 3,000 feet in free fall, and then spread out across the desert for about four miles, called the Black Hawk Landslide. Amazing. And just north of Barstow is a wonderful place called Rainbow Basin. It's where many of the universities send their students out for a week to teach them how to make a geologic map. Very colorful, lots of good geologic structure there, easy to get to. Red Rock Canyon is a place where uh, geologists also visit to teach students how to map. Very colorful, very beautiful place to visit. Way out over here in the east is Mitchell Caverns, the, one of the only really good caverns in the state of California. It uh, is about a, oh, I'd say it's um, hmm, maybe a six hour drive out there the, at the most. Uh, you'd wanna stay over at night camp in one of the nearby campgrounds. And uh, you do have to make reservations to go in there and you, you are guided by a state park ranger. And uh, it's a very good tour. Uh, I sure recommend that. 14 points to the two volcanoes I've told you about, uh, Amboy and Pisgah. So there are many things to uh, here to go out and see. I think there's about 20 of them. The um, map in the lower right corner is typical of the kind of map that is in the book that will guide you to these various places. And this one is for Morro Rock. Uh, Morro Rock out here, just off outside Morro Bay, the city of. And then there's Black Hill and Cerro Cabrillo and Hollister Peak, et cetera, all the way down to Orchid Knob and Islay Hill, 13 of them. And now as we get closer to the end, I want to give you a preview of the book that I'm working on right now with uh, Alan Glazner, who is a publisher of Geology Underfoot in Yosemite National Park. Uh, he and I did this book, uh, Geology Underfoot in Southern California. We were just up in the Bishop area working on a book that will be entitled Geology Underfoot in Death Valley and Eastern California. Uh, we were up here in what's called the buttermilk country of near Bishop. And uh, the object there was try to come up with an explanation of these monstrous boulders that are just sitting right out there in the ground. I have arrows over here on the upper left pointing to some people to give you some idea of just how big these boulders are. They're huge. And um, uh, you talk to the climbers who love to go and climb these boulders and they'll say, oh, um, these are boulders. I mean, they, they came from somewhere. Yeah, okay, well, maybe the glaciers brought them down here. Um, no, that's not the answer. 
uh, I will not tell you what the answer is. I will let you figure that out when we get to um, when we get close to the time for the book to come out, and we hope it's going to be published by. Uh, well, we're sending it out to the editor in the next couple of weeks, and we hope it's published before summer and will be available for you when you finally break away out of your confines of your own home and get out and start seeing some of the world and particularly some of the geology. I hope you'll do that. Well, that's my 40 minutes. I thank you for joining us and, and uh, many thanks to Kate, and Nikki, and Mark, and to the Cedric Reserve. And uh, I hope that all of you will have learned a little bit of, at least uh, learned of some of the places that you wanna go see here in the future. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Art. That was a great talk. I, I was taking notes on places I want to go visit, having lived in California myself only for a few years. Um, so please uh, type your questions into the chat box or the Q&A. So Art, the first question was from Tim Ferguson, and uh, he is curious if uh, you could talk a little about snakes in the desert in the Mojave. Oh, well, I'm not a herpetologist, but I can tell you that uh, snakes are where you find them. And uh, uh, I've, and, and when I'm doing honest work in the field, and that includes up here in the San Inez Mountains, um, when I'm out in the field, I probably can count on one hand the number of rattlesnakes I've seen. I've seen lots of other kinds of snakes, but uh, rattlesnakes, hardly any. However, uh, out in the Mojave Desert, there's one rattlesnake that you really want to avoid. It uh, has both a neurotoxin and a hemotoxin. It's called the Mojave Green. And I've run into one of those just once. And uh, it was when we had a class out in the field. And I had a, a big walking stick. And I just went over to the snake and said, hey, snake, you got to get out of the way. It's our turn to be out here. So I lifted him very carefully and moved him off outside the area we were going to be working. Never saw him again. Never saw another Mojave green in that area. Great. Um, Blake Edgar was wondering if you could repeat the title of your new book that'll include the buttermilks. The new book will be called Geology Underfoot in Death Valley and Eastern California. And it's going to be about half of Death Valley and then uh, Owens Valley and up in the Mammoth area be a lot of volcanic rocks um, and a lot of the wonderful sights that you see in Death Valley. It's going to, we, we're just having such a fun time putting it together. I can't wait to get it out. Great. Just to and, chime into the relevance of that book, uh, question for Art is that, uh, would that book be useful if you say, like to drive up to Mammoth to ski or to hike around? Would that book help you explore sites uh, to, going to and from Mammoth on US 395? Oh, yes. There are several things right along the Owens Valley, uh, including one place called Fossil Falls. It uh, was the site of a huge, big river that was going uh, through the Mojave Desert in, um, and out and finally ended up in Death Valley in uh, glacial times. And probably around 15,000 to 10,000 years ago, it was really roaring and made an incredible waterfall at Fossil Falls. And then uh, there's a big volcanic field up in near Big Pine that we uh, are going to include in the book this time. It goes up to the Bristlecone Pines, uh, takes in the uh, Bishop Tuff. Uh, above Bishop there is a big volcanic plateau. And then once you get to Mammoth, it takes in, uh, goes up the top of Mammoth Mountain, for example, looks at the Long Valley Caldera and uh, Obsidian Dome, Mono Craters and Panem Crater. Awesome. So we have a question from Amy Herman, and she asks, what are the main rocks found in the Santa Inez Riverbed? Uh, boy, that's, that's great. Um, I mentioned all the beautiful rocks you can get at Moonstone Beach. Many of those same kinds of rocks are in the creek beds on Sedgwick Ranch. Uh, Santa Inez River, uh, you might just find mostly uh, sandstone and uh, that would be about it. But boy, on the creeks there in Sedgwick Ranch, you'll find bits and pieces of the Franciscan formation, which includes red shirt, black shirt, white shirt, yellow shirt, even green shirt. And uh, I've gotten some of the most beautiful rocks 
from one of those creeks and put them on my backyard railroad. Awesome. I'm, I'm curious, Art, uh, if you can talk a little bit about the process of writing these books. Have, did you personally hike all of these trails and, and go to all these great places? Well, the answer is yes. I didn't do it all at once. Um, I've been doing these, uh, many of these places over my entire career. Um, I, uh, over, over the years, I led more than 300 field trips, mostly in Southern California. So I came to know a lot of these places really well. To do the roadside geology of Southern California, I ended up driving 13,000 miles to get out to all these places to be sure I knew what I was doing, what I was seeing, what I was going to talk about. Then for a road a geology underfoot, I drove another, another 6,000 miles. And then for this Death Valley and um, Eastern California book, I have just driven this past week about 1,500 miles, uh, fact checking and taking more pictures. The thing about uh, uh, roadside uh, geology was that was new. Uh, you, you asked how I came to write it. I um, was approached by the Mountain Press about 25 years ago and they said, would you write this book? And I says, no, I don't uh, know enough and I don't have the time, call me back in a year. They didn't call me back. And then uh, no, about uh, maybe uh, eight years ago, I was driving back from Bryce Canyon National Park with my family and I was thinking to myself as I was driving, boy, I know what's going on over in those mountains and I know what that rock is over there. These are things that uh, students will, may never know because they do most of their geology on the computer these days and they don't get out in the field. So I ought to write about this. Called up Mountain Press. Mountain, I said, Mountain Press, have you got somebody to write Southern California yet? Uh, no, well, I can do it. Okay, send us a proposal. 10 days later, I sent a proposal in and they had a contract 10 days after that. Uh, I won't go into the <laughs> details of the next two books, but uh, it's been a wonderful thing to do and I've have greatly enjoyed it, learned a lot. Wonderful. All right, we've got a couple of uh, great questions coming in. So Teresa Bothman asked, do you have any recommendation of where to find layman geology field trips to join? Yes and no. Um, many of the uh, geological societies in Southern California, including the Coast Geological Society in Ventura, the South Coast Geological Society of, out of San, uh, Santa Anita, um, Santa Ana, um, and even some of the uh, um, state colleges and community colleges, they run field trips. And if you were to ask them if you could be on it, they might say, yes, we'd be happy to have you on it. When I was uh, running field trips out of UCSB, we welcomed people from the community, not a whole big crowd of them, but uh, now and then people would say, gee, I'd like to go on your field trip. Well, come along with us. We're happy to have you. Uh, just uh, help us pay with the transportation fee and uh, the food money and you're very welcome. Uh, that's about the best I can suggest. I don't know. If, oh, yeah, one more. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management does run field trips now and then. Uh, a fellow by the name of Greg Wilkerson is the one who usually leads these field trips. And uh, uh, if you can Google him and find out about his trips, you'd be very welcome on them. Great. So Dennis Beebe would like to know, what is your backdrop scene? That is the Red Rock Canyon. That's also the cover of the book. Uh, yeah, I'll get out of the way of it and see a little better. That's a beautiful place to go. And uh, uh, probably a million people drive past that every year. And probably uh, only a, a handful of them ever stop there and look at it. They have a nice little museum there. There's great hiking around there. Just uh, go in a, a, not in the dead of summer and uh, take some water with you. And uh, uh, there's some Beautiful things to see there. Go there for sure. Awesome, I'm in. <laughs> uh, Jim Ford would like to know, uh, what is the present volcanic activity in Long Valley at Mammoth? <coughs> Excuse me, um, that was my eruption. 
Uh, the last eruption in Long Valley was about 600 years ago. Uh, there were a flurry of earthquakes there in 1980. And ever since, the US Geological Survey has been trying to understand why those earthquakes occurred and are they related to volcanic activity. The conclusion is, yes, they are related to volcanic activity down at depth, depths of about uh, eight to 12 miles deep. And uh, what, whether this is gonna lead to an eruption or not is anybody's guess. Uh, nobody would be surprised to see an eruption there, but nobody's expecting one either. So the, uh, the next question, Kevin uh, Kingma asks whether there's any serpentine rock found in Southern California. Oh, yes. Lots of serpentine right there on Cedric Ranch, yeah. even right. right up in the north end. Yeah, it's part of the Franciscan formation. And uh, uh, you won't find much of that up at Moonstone Beach because serpentine is a fairly fragile rock. It tends to break down fairly easily. So you put it into a surf zone like at Moonstone Beach and it's going to get all beat up and broken up. So you won't find it there, but you do find it, uh, well, especially in outcrop uh, up there in Sidgwick Ranch. Go there. You'll find a lot of it. That's right. And a related question from John Ritter. He, he asked if you could describe uh, about the Sedgwick geology, including faults. Uh, Sedgwick geology is broken into two parts, separated by the Little Pine Fault. North of the Little Pine Fault is the Franciscan Formation. Uh, south of the fault is uh, the Paso Robles Formation, which is oh, about a uh, uh, oh, five to 10 million year old sandstone and conglomerate. Uh, it's fairly simple geology until you start looking at the details of the Franciscan Formation, and then it's pretty thorny and pretty knotty. One of my former students has just mapped a big swatch of the Franciscan Formation east of Sedgwick Ranch uh, in the Rancho San Fernando Ray area and uh, a big section to the east of that. His map is in publication right now and should be published soon. We hope he'll come and map the same rocks on Cedric Ranch very soon. Okay. And uh, so you've got a couple of compliments in here. Larry Ballard said, your, your treatment of the Ventura Avenue, Anticline and Grant Park in your recent book is excellent. And he was able to see all of the features that you mentioned. Oh, good, good, good. That's a, that is a fun place to go for the day. And the view from uh, up there on Grant Park out over the ocean and the Ventura area, Oxnard area is just splendid. So yeah, great, thank you. Wonderful. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Um, I'd like to, to thank you, Art, very much for giving us uh, your time and, and sharing all these great places. And uh, if, um, if anyone thinks of more questions, feel free to email me and I can share a few with Art, but hopefully you're inspired to get out and, and go see some local geology. Good, thanks, Nikki. Yes, thanks everyone. Thanks, Nikki, thanks, Art. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye.